chair this session on accessing digital content. I want to make one announcement first, um, and that is um, please remember that the developers challenge is today at five, the show and tell for the developers challenge. This is always a really exciting event every year at open repositories, um, and this year promises to be no different. Um, there's a change from what's in the program. The event will be here um, in Lecture Theater 4 um, because we generally need a bigger space. Um, so please come out um, promptly at 5 um, to see the entries for um, the Developers Challenge. For those of you who don't know, the developers are competing for um, a 1,000 pound prize. Um, and this is sponsored by, by JISC and Microsoft. So please come, come out and see the Developers Challenge. So I first want to introduce our, our first speaker this session. We have two speakers this session um, who are going to each speak around 20 to 25 minutes. Um, so we do have a fair amount of flexibility for questions um, because we have a little more time. Um, but this session may, may end a bit, a bit early, so you may have a chance to jump into another session. Um, my first um, speaker, though, is Miguel Moreira. Um, and he will be, he is a project manager um, for RERO, the Library Network of Western Switzerland. So, welcome. Clip that on. Thank you, Sarah. Everybody can hear me? No? Better? Yeah, it's okay? Behind? You can hear me? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to talk about Multiview, which is a, a, a generic browser and visualizer for digital objects. The summary of my talk, I'll, I'll make a, a, an introduction, uh, do a demo and features, talk about the highlights and then a, a bit about how it works inside, how you can integrate it in your own uh, sites, and then uh, um, a bit of a uh, outlook and resources. First, what is MultiView? As you can read here, it's a generic browser and visualizer for digital objects. At the same time, it's a presentation <laughs> layer for document servers, and by document servers we mean institutional repositories, digital libraries, any such kind of thing. And it's an add-on customizable that you can apply independently to uh, any kind of, 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 of these uh, servers. And the main principle is that uh, when users are searching or browsing uh, uh, a document server, they are provided with immediate access to the digital content that's inside the, ser the, the, the server. And this is done directly inside the web browser, as you, as you will see. So what's Hero? Uh, as you saw, it's the library network of Western Switzerland. That's where I, I work. And we have a, a digital library called uh, HeroDoc. It's a multi-institutional multi uh, digital library because we have several uh, libraries in, in our network. And we have different content types. We have both academic scientific content and also heritage and uh, general uh, documentation. And in 2006, we <coughs> we found out that we, we needed to, to improve the, the presentation layer for full text files. So we needed something capable of handling uh, structure-rich documents like uh, uh, journals, newspapers, and multi-volume documents, and uh, especially in the case of uh, uh, heritage uh, collections. That was very important because it's an important part of, of the digital library. And the limitations that we found in the usual approach of just providing the links to, to the to, to PDF download or, or whatever kind of file uh, download is that uh, if a document is composed of, of several files, uh, that's not a, a really uh, nice solution. Uh, it also requires people to download the whole file 
And also the fact that if a user finds a document uh, through a search operation in the, in the website, uh, then it's going to fetch the files and it has to, to search again inside the files to, to find the, the text or, or that, was, that he, he or she was looking for. So uh, we made a, a bit of a market research to, do, to, to know what was available and we didn't find anything uh, flexible enough for our, for our needs. So uh, at the same time, there was a, a national innovation and cooperation program in Switzerland that was uh, launching uh, called elive.ch, it's called the Electronic Library of Switzerland. It's, it started in 2008 and ran until uh, 2011. Actually, there's now a, a follow-up uh, going on. And m we presented uh, a proposal for a, a project called Multiview, and it was accepted, and so this project was co-funded uh, by uh, elive.ch. We launched the first official version in summer of 2011, uh, and since th this uh, uh, funding period has ended, now Multiview is run as a standard uh, open source software project. It's run and hosted by Rero, uh, suited to the, the needs of Rero Docs uh, uh, in particular, but uh, under the principles of openness and uh, uh, extensibility. So how does it work? Uh, you simply provide a URL pointing to a file, maybe a PDF, or an image, a video or sound recording. Uh, I must say that they are not yet implemented, but they're, they're in, in the works. And you can also provide a URL that uh, points to a combination of files. This can be a bibliographic record, like a Dublin core record, a mark or, or, or mods, or you can even provide a METS file that aggregates uh, a lot of content. I'll show you an example. Um, in a moment. So Multivo will take this URL, find out what's behind, uh, uh, investigate the structure uh, and the content, put everything together and provide it to the user in a, in a um, uh, convenient interface and allow to navigate and search inside it. So <coughs> here I, I show the different kind of structure of, of content that you can provide to Multivo, either, either a, a, a single file like a PDF, it may contain embedded metadata, it may contain a table of contents. Uh, you can provide a, a bi bibliographic record with pointers to several files, or uh, a METS record uh, with pointers, with, with a structure, an embedded structure that points afterwards to, 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 to files, for example, to image files. This is a, a, a standard approach for, um, for scanned books, for example or you can even uh, embed a set of bibliographic records inside a single match record. So I'll make a, a demo. I'll take Herodoc as the, because that's where the, uh, we have the, um, we have Multiview running. So I'll go to books. These are the, the latest editions uh, when this one is from today, this one is from yesterday. Uh, actually, there are several documents being deposited by the um, International Olympic Committee, which, whose library is part of uh, our network, and there are several documents related to the, uh, to the Olympic Games in London uh, right now. So uh, the user is presented with thumbnails of the first page of, of the documents. This, this is one feature of Multiview that I'll talk about later. And uh, by clicking on this image, the, the document is presented here. So we're inside the browser. This is all HTML and JavaScript. Uh, I can browse the, the content of the file, can switch pages and everything. If I move the window here, I can switch <coughs> from one document to the other and <coughs> the content is presented immediately here. So this uh, uh, kind of sentence, uh, as you see, it's, it's very fast. And so these are, these are documents with a, single, with a single file. Now I'll show you the detailed record for, for this document, for example. We have two PDF files, one with, with the, the English version of the document and the other with the, the French version. And 
what happens here is that if I click in either of, of the, the images, I have the document. If I open here the, the document structure, both PDFs are presented on the same uh, structure. So I can browse the English version or the, the French version. I can jump from one to the other, and this is done in a, in a single um, interface. I can also search, for example, well, this is actually, a, a, this I, if I search budget, it, this is a word that is uh, uh, valid for both English and French. So it's going to find <laughs> occurrences of the word budget in the, in the two PDF files uh, uh, at once, and they are, uh, then I can jump to the, to the occurrence inside the text. Uh, this is standard operation. So remember, this is all done using uh, JavaScript and HTML. All the processing is done by a server uh, behind uh, on the fly. So there's no uh, pre-indexing uh, uh, of these contents. Uh, the search search is done on the fly. So what what I mean to show here is that, as you can see, the user has really immediate access to the content by a few clicks. Can it can see uh, immediately what's behind the document if if he or she wants to read it, it can go ahead and and read it. Uh, uh, can open the window, uh, make it make it full screen, uh, so it gives me more space. That's uh, that's better. <coughs> okay, so it, I'll come back to the first page. I'll now show you uh, journals. There's a, a, a journal section, and there's a an old journal called uh, Revue Neuchâteloise. This is a journal that has been scanned by one of our libraries. And actually, uh, they we have created um, a bibliographic record by decade. So it means that, um, no, sorry. Uh, we have a single bibli bibliographic record, but we have uh, one PDF file uh, per decade. So here I have a PDF file for 1957 to 59, this is when the, the journal started, then 60 to 61, uh, well, actually, it's not really decayed, but uh, uh, never mind. What, what I mean to show here is that this, this record uh, contains uh, about 14 or, I think, 14 PDF files, and the files are very large, because if I, if I go here, this one makes uh, 136 me megabytes, uh, this one, uh, 100, 36. On the whole, this document contains about one gigabyte uh, of content. And by clicking here, I have access to the whole collection on a unified interface. So using the, the, the structured navigation, I can jump from one file to the other. So the user doesn't even know, doesn't even need to know that these are, are uh, different PDF files, the, the, the document has been split in, di in different PDF files. It has access to, to the content as a whole without needing to know, to know about that. Uh, another example is the, we have a collection called Genealogic Tables of Fribourg uh, Families. And this is a collection of 146 records each record describes, uh, a this is someone that did this a few years ago, uh, each record uh, contains uh, the genealogy of one family. So we have uh, Anglois, Azigné, uh, Banqueta, this, these are all uh, family names. And each one of these records contains two or three PDF files with uh, the manuscript uh, version and the uh, uh, type, uh, typewriter, typewriter based version. Uh, so. Each record, uh, I can see the XML Dublin core. I have two identifier tags with pointers to PDFs. And what we did here, well, with Multiview, I can see this record and access the two PDF files that are inside. Or what I can do, because we, we created a maths file that contains pointers to these 146 bibliographic records. That's the only thing we, 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 we did. And we put 
that pointer available here as in the, in the, the collection description. And if the user clicks here, Multiview opens with a set of 146 uh, records, ag again provided as a whole. <coughs> that makes uh, uh, makes it easier for the user to. Well, currently it's not easy, uh, yet possible to search in this kind of structure using a match record, but that's something that we are implementing uh, now. So basically, that's what I wanted to show about uh, Multiview. So just a summary of functionalities. The main functionality is to display documents in a, in a web browser. Uh, there's structural navigation, thumbnail navigation. Uh, as, I saw, uh, as I showed, uh, the you, you can find text uh, inside the document. It's possible to select text for copy and paste. There's zoom, rotation, overview widget, and there's also the possibility of downloading the file, the PDF file or, or whatever, if the user uh, uh, desires. So, uh, Multiview dynamically explores the hierarchical structure of the document, be it a file or a set of files. Uh, it extracts the metadata, internal structure. If there are several files, it extracts the list of files and then is going to, to do this uh, analysis again for each one of the files, uh, gather all this together and provide it to the user using the interface that, um, that um, I show you. Oh, uh, in terms of highlights, why? Is Multiview interesting? Why may, may it, uh, uh, it be of interest uh, for you? Because it, it provides elegant sp support for uh, multi-file documents. It's very fast and lightweight. Uh, there is no need to download entire files. Content, the content is pre-processed. And as you saw, uh, it can provide uh, uh, access to very large uh, documents and uses uh, low bandwidth. One thing that is very important to know is that uh, Multiview is very uh, unintrusive. It, it doesn't require you to, to pre-calculate uh, uh, images of different resolutions or whatever. You just provide it URL, URLs of content that you already, already have uh, available in your servers and it will take care of uh, in investigating what's inside and extracting what's needed to present it to, to the user. Uh, a comfortable interface. Uh, everything is standards based, so HTML, JavaScript, uh, CSS, no, no, no need for Flash or, 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 or similar. Uh, it supports very well known metadata formats, very well known file types. Um, there's basic support for touch devices in the sense that it works, but it's not really developed for touch devices. So uh, there's some, some work to be done here to, in, in order to, to optimize it. And you can configure it to your own um, server. Uh, just a word that, uh, uh, to say that we, we Motivio uh, under, underwent a usability evaluation in the, fr in the framework of elite.ch, and it uh, actually had a, a very nice mm, outcome. So how does it work? As I said previously, there, there are two layers, the client layer that works in the browser, and there's a server layer, and also the document server, but this is not part of Multiview. It just has to work uh, uh, together with it. So what's the role of the client layer? It's a full feature of HTML5 document viewer. It's a visible part of the application that allows uh, user interaction. It's based on JavaScript, HTML, CSS, I already said. Uh, the technologies that we use, uh, the frameworks, is. Uh, are called Sprout Core and jQuery, <coughs> and the requirement is uh, uh, simply a, a modern browser. The server layer, what it does is page rendering, uh, search uh, inside the documents and text extraction, authentication also, so the server is performing this, the kind of um, microservices that the user interface needs in order to provide the content to, to the user. It's, it's written uh, um, on Python and it uses Poplar, which is a very important uh, component of Multiview. This is a library that is very well known that it's the base of uh, uh, several uh, PDF viewers in, in, in Unix systems and it's, it's very uh, uh, it's, it's very fast and works very well, and Multiview uses it in order to, to process uh, PDF files. Uh, there's a requirement, which is the fact that the content must be fetched from the, the original location 
into the multiview server. And this, this is a, a, an important implication. I'll talk about uh, more about that um, uh, in a moment. There's a client API, so if you want to include the, the multi-view interface in your, in your site, you can call it using different parameters. Of course, there's one of them is mandatory, which is the URL. Uh, file reference, if, you, if your document contains several files, which one you, you want to, to show uh, first. The page number, also you can, can say which page number to, so, to, to show first. The search expression, and this is going to make multi-view open with the search results uh, shown to the user. Uh, the graphical theme, the language. In terms of uh, server API, uh, <coughs> you can ask it to, to render a page. For example, you, you, you can use the, the server layer directly uh, without the client layer. So you can, if you have a PDF file, you can tell the, the server, uh, the Multivio server API, give me uh, an image of page 15 in a resolution uh, 400 pixels, for example, and the server will return um, the required image. So it also uh, uh, extracts text, uh, the, the search, and everything that is needed by the client. And these APIs are publicly available. Uh, they are made available by, by Rehu at this address, uh, demo.multiview.org, so you can try uh, how it works to know if it works for you or, or not. www.multiview.org provides all the information you need. Uh, it has project information, developer resources, uh, access to the source code. Uh, and if you need something that you cannot find there, you just contact us. We, are, we will be glad to, to, to help you. So now, in terms of integration, if you want to try it, <coughs> First, as I said, there's the public demonstrator. You can go to demo.multiview.org and play with it and see uh, what it does with your content. There's also the possibility of uh, using the preview feature, uh, which is a nice way of uh, presenting your files uh, on your web pages or on your document server. And you can also install your own server layer if required. And you, you, you'll know, uh, I'll, I'll show you uh, why it is interesting. So about the preview feature. This is a user-friendly way of presenting files, such as PDFs or uh, images or whatever, in any HTML file. Here you have two examples of uh, uh, a link to one PDF file uh, in a different form. So this is, this is configurable. You can uh, uh, define how you want, uh, you want it to be presented. And this is just, you just need to include uh, a block of JavaScript uh, uh, code in your HTML page, and this is going to, to do uh, the, the work uh, automatically. So it, it, if it finds PDF links inside the page, it's going to generate a thumbnail and, and put it in the page instead of the, the, the link. So it's, it's very easy to do uh, with just basic HTML uh, knowledge, but if you want to, to go further and uh, customize it uh, further, it's th there's also the possibility. Uh, everything is described, excuse me, everything is described on this, uh, on this web page. So your own Multivio installation. What are the advantages? Uh, performance, because you have local file access instead of relying on, on HTTP uh, transfers. I have a slide. Um, I have a slide that, that shows, shows that. You can customize the user interface and you can provide uh, access control. Uh, requirements are, are quite simple. A web server, a Python uh, with, some, with a few libraries that you must install, multi-view sources, and uh, local network access to the text files are, are recommended. Uh, here, here is the, the slide. So if you work locally, this is the, the client with the web browser, and <coughs> it calls the Multiview server for all kinds of services that I described before. And in this case, the Multiview server has network, local network access to the document server. Uh, so when it, for example, if it needs to, to handle a PDF file, it doesn't need to download it from anywhere. It just accesses the PDF file directly in, uh, with the file system. Whereas if you use a, a remote uh, Multiview server, which is the case if you, you use demo.multiview.org that we make available, that server will need to fetch the content v via HTTP from the document server. 
So here you see that if you have a large file, the user will have to wait, at least the first time, will have to wait for the file to be fetched from the, the, the original place, the document server, into its own uh, uh, file system in order to, to work on it. Integration examples. At Rero, we have integrated Multiview in several ways. The digital library Revodoc, as I showed you. We have uh, uh, in our website, uh, our website uh, a section with a, a newsletter, and we provide thumbnails. Uh, um, here they are. We provide thumbnails for, for the documents using Multiview, so this is all done uh, automatically. Uh, we also use it in our uh, OPAC in order to generate the thumbnails for some of the documents uh, uh, that are presented. At the University of Lausanne, they also uh, are using Multiview. They installed their own uh, server. And uh, recently, uh, the core portal, uh, which is being presented here, there's a slide, uh, there's a, um, a poster available. They, also, uh, uh, they are also using Multiview, although they didn't yet install their own uh, server. So they are using demo.multiview.org as the server for presenting uh, Multiview in their, in, their, in their site. So next feature, features are uh, support for audio and video, uh, authentication and access control, uh, and also a calendar navigation. This is very important for us because we have several uh, newspapers uh, and, and journals in, in our digital library and it would be interesting for our users to be able to navigate uh, in a time in a time based uh, manner we also uh, intend to, to to improve support for mobile devices and we are always working uh, uh, in the integration in a better integration with uh, Herodoc. my final slide with links and resources so the multiview platform the demonstrator the source code repository, the web page of Rero, and the digital library. And if you have any question, or if you want to install it, or uh, whatever, or if you want to participate in the development, <coughs> just contact us. We, we are really open to, to any kind of collaboration or assistance uh, that is needed. That's all. So hello, my name is Panagiotis Tathopoulos from uh, Documentation Center of uh, Greece. One question is, uh, do you do any pre-processing of the PDF files? That is, uh, do you generate any JPEG uh, thumbnails or JPEG different images before at the ingestion time, or is everything on the fly? Everything is done on the fly. And actually, uh, as I said, we're using Poplar. And Poplar is very efficient in the way it handles PDFs. So if you, even if you have a PDF, I don't know, of 500 megabytes, and if you, you tell it to fetch page 15, it's not going to load the whole uh, file in memory. It, 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 it's able to, to fetch that content in, in, in a very efficient manner. So we take advantage of it, and we, it doesn't really require any kind of pre-processing. Okay, uh, many thanks for the very interesting talk and the great work uh, behind that. It's a really useful and nice tool. Um, uh, two short questions. Uh, regarding image-only PDFs, do you, sub do you have a mechanism to support full text search and hit highlighting for these as well? Probably uh, integra with um, integration to optical character recognition systems. And the second question, uh, is every page, let's say, uh, of the document, uh, does every page of the document uh, have its own URL so that the user can probably bookmark it, share it, or uh, also uh, the, at the server side, one can have, let's say, uh, a monitoring of the navigation patterns of uh, users within pages? Thank you. That's a very, very interesting question. Concerning the first question, the answer is no. Uh, in the sense that Multiview doesn't do any OCR processing uh, itself. So it relies on the OCR that is present on the documents and doesn't do anything, uh, uh, any such kind of thing, uh, such a thing uh, on, on the fly. Concerning the second uh, question, you can uh, create, uh, establish a URL. As I said, I, I mentioned the, the API. 
the client API where you can say, uh, you can provide a URL for a file uh, and you can say, tell the page number. So this is, this is one way of creating a bookmark. Uh, but we are not currently uh, using it, uh, as you said, in order to, to analyze what are the pages that the user uh, looks more often in the, this document. But that's something that could be done, actually. Yeah, th I'd also like to thank you for the very, very great uh, work that you've done. And my question is, um, for for multimedia like video and audio, do you what kind of experience do you have with this tool for this type of formats? Just if you could comment on if you have that type of content and if you well, we we are. We are st now starting to have that kind of content in uh, the digital library. And the only thing that we have is a, a, a prototype uh, where we, we were able to show uh, video content using the MultiView interface. But it's, it's a very basic prototype and it only supports one uh, uh, video format. So I, I cannot really tell a lot about that. We, we must work on that. It's, it's, uh, it's a kind of a challenge to work to work on that, but at least we know that it's possible, and we will uh, most certainly rely on HTML5 and uh, the capabilities of uh, of modern browsers. And that's that's the technology that we that we use uh, might even uh, be able to 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 fall back on Flash if needed. So uh, it means that the the internal part of the viewer could uh, embed a flash player and play the, the video if there's no other uh, format available but that's something that we must investigate further but currently the the video format that you you have experience with is is, is it mpeg is that uh, no i don't think so okay i don't think so i don't remember I don't, uh, we, did, we did it a few months ago i don't remember but it's not mpeg no <laughs> Could you give us some uh, some more information about the access control? Well, access control was also on the list of uh, things to to be done. Right now, the solution that we propose for access control is to um, install the MultiView server alongside the documents that uh, must be um, protected, because. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, the MultiView server must have access to the files that will be presented to the user. So if a, fi if a user uh, wants to access some PDF file, for example, in the server, and it has uh, 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 the rights to do it uh, via, I don't know, some authentication system, it can, watch, uh, it can access the file, but if it does it uh, via MultiView, MultiView doesn't uh, necessarily have those uh, 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 rights, so we have to find some way to, to provide those rights to MultiView. And the solution that we propose and that uh, the University of Lausanne is experimenting, we are not using it uh, uh, yet, is to install uh, an instance of a MultiView server alongside the, the, the documents that must be protected so the mechanism is going to, to be used transparently as it, as it would be used for, for, for accessing the, for the files directly. Any other questions? Thanks. Uh, Phil Butler, University of Manchester. Um, we've heard other talkers talking about usage metrics and they're becoming increasingly important for repositories. Uh, this is going to change the game, I think. I wonder if you've had any thoughts about download metrics and how this might interact with such things. Yeah, it's related to the question that was posed there. And it's, it's really an interesting uh, uh, area uh, uh, of development. We didn't yet uh, started working on that, but we intend to do it because we also think that for, for our digital library, Multivu can bring uh, a, a lot of information about the, the usage. Well, we cannot... Uh, it's, it's not the only way of you, uh, accessing the content because we, we still provide uh, the direct uh, download links. But it's, it, we already we, we do a basic uh, analysis based on, on MultiView, but we can go much further, much further with that, actually.
Thank you. And we're uh, to introduce our, our next speaker who's making his way up. Um, our next speaker is uh, Nikos Kusos. Um, who is the software development manager um, of the National Documentation Center in Greece. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this you? Is this you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many thanks for the introduction and the excellent pronunciation uh, <laughs> of my name in, uh, in Greek. So, uh, So um, I'm afraid that uh, my presentation will relate to tools that are uh, uh, related to the backend side of things, uh, the tedious work for data transformations that is uh, uh, less frequently acknowledged, let's say. Uh, so uh, what I will present is an open source library, an open source framework called Biblio Transformation Engine that uh, we have developed and uh, used uh, <coughs> for the past four or five years to facilitate uh, data transformations in the areas of digital libraries, scholarly communication systems. So uh, we will present our solution for this very common problem and a number of uh, use cases. This tool has been used extensively over the last few years. So we have dozens of uh, use cases. We will present some of them that uh, we consider uh, more interesting. So I think I, I don't need to convince anybody about the uh, major requirement of data transformations in uh, digital libraries. It's something that uh, comes up all the time. Uh, it's uh, a, rout a routine type of job in um, in the digital libraries uh, domain, uh, for digital repositories, uh, library automation systems, e-publishing systems, research information systems, everything. Uh, you need to uh, transform data to, for example, to, to bulk load uh, data to, to a repository or a library catalog or an e-publishing system, to uh, migrate data uh, from uh, different formats, for example, to, to share the data in your repository in a, in a different uh, format, in a different metadata schema than uh, the one uh, used to store the data. And uh, this procedure is definitely painful and tedious and of course needs to uh, uh, constantly adjust to the evolution of uh, metadata schemata, formats, encoding schemes and so on. So there are uh, many little pieces that constitute such a data transformation task. And uh, many of these little subtasks uh, appear again and again in this procedure. And uh, this means that they could be reused. So the idea behind the, the library, the, this framework that uh, we're presenting today, is that there's a need for a systematic framework to, let's say, manage the, the code to do this uh, data transformation so that uh, it is possible to facilitate reuse and accelerate uh, common transformation tasks. A little. I think it's okay. <laughs> is it okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, to create such a framework, one has to do an analysis. So, uh, investigate, let's say, various data transformation tasks and see what are the common elements, what are the abstractions, let's say, that could be used to represent this procedure and then develop a generic framework and the uh, library that, ca that can let's say, cater for this uh, procedure. And then, 
we have done this analysis and we have found out that uh, at first uh, in a data transformation task you retrieve source data records and then you apply of course some processing what can this processing be well almost anything but some basic categories let's say of transformations uh, the one thing that uh, it's always there is the mapping of the source format to the output format okay this is uh, always uh, there there are some optional let's say uh, steps for example removing data records so for example from a uh, from a pool of uh, 100 records one probably needs to provide to an external system 50 of these records according to specific criteria so there's a possibility to uh, to filter out some some records uh, also and this is uh, uh, very common of course as well uh, there's the need to add modify or delete field values within records so uh, you don't remove let's say records but you do specific let's say uh, transformations of values within records addition of of new records uh, of new fields sorry uh, deletion of field values that are not needed to be provided to external systems and so on and then after you have done that you just generate the desired output and uh, this could be a data export a file that uh, will be generated and uh, sent out to another system uh, and maybe the, uh, it could also be that uh, the system directly apply, updates a database a catalog uh, another system via uh, a web service and so on so that that's the the overall procedure uh, what we have found out there uh, the a less obvious let's say uh, need is the need for incremental or selective data loading so for example uh, you might need to say that okay I will uh, retrieve only 100 records at a time do some processing uh, generate output and then uh, proceed with the next uh, 100 records this is a common case for example in uh, OAI PMH servers where you through the resumption token mechanism uh, even if you need to uh, provide let's say thousands of records you do that in an incremental uh, manner uh, providing 100 records for example at a time so uh, uh, in the overall procedure we say that there need to be let's say uh, conditions that are applied before processing and before uh, the output procedure uh, so that uh, the let's say the loading of data uh, is repeated before proceeding for example to processing or uh, to output in some cases so uh, let's have a look at the major design goals of our library we said that uh, we wanted to develop something for reusability for acceleration of data transformation tasks the major design goal is the separation of concerns in development. So as we said before, it's the data transformation task consists of many little pieces, let's say, of transformations. So um, we have a systematic way of organizing the, the code, let's say, of the transformation so that uh, it is modularized in those little pieces uh, so that they can be easily uh, reused and also make let's say the different pieces independent of the other so uh, for example uh, uh, a function then that uh, harmonizes date values doesn't need to be dependent on a specific input format uh, it, it does not need to be aware whether the input format is mark or Dublin core or serif or whatever um, and uh, we want this to be customizable non-intrusive easy to use and integrate uh, in any other system. Uh, so wha what's the solution with, uh, which we came up with? Uh, this is the, let's say, a depiction of the architecture of the, of the system. One can see the uh, data loader uh, on the left-hand side. 
it is configured through uh, what we call loading specs, which say, for example, how many records uh, should be loaded at a time. Uh, then, uh, as soon as the data is loaded, we have uh, our data transformed into a specific abstraction that we have uh, created, which is called record. So the a record object, independent on the input format, has a specific interface for retrieving and updating data uh, on it. So these, let's say, uh, records that have uh, resulted from the data loading procedure are fed into what we call the transformation work workflow. Uh, this workflow consists of discrete steps. And uh, let me, for a moment, go to the next slide to uh, elaborate a little bit on them. Uh, we have two kinds of uh, processing steps. Uh, the first uh, category is uh, are the filters, uh, that the uh, pieces of uh, code that remove records according to specific criteria. Uh, the modifier is the piece of code that updates records to specific criteria. And the initializer is not a processing step per se, it's a supporting, let's say, object that initializes data within processing steps. For example, uh, one could easily uh, think of a filter saying, uh, filter out any record that uh, where the, let's say, the country value or the language value is not in a specific, within a specific list of values. So this list of values is loaded by the initializer to to configure, the, let's say, the, uh, the overall process. Then we have the output generator, which creates the uh, desired output. And between, let's say, uh, the data loading and the transformation workflow uh, and the uh, uh, transformation workflow and the output generator procedures, there are conditions that um, enable the, the system, let's say, to go back to data loading and um, uh, perform some additional uh, loading of data brief brief before uh, going further to the next uh, step. So um, this, let's say, uh, system has been very useful for us to, let's say, do many, many kinds of uh, transformations. You see also some of them, uh, only a few of them depicted uh, on this slide. Uh, so we have used it to read data from uh, repositories for uh, uh, Z39.50 servers from library catalogs, from research information systems following the serif format, from Excel files, from custom XML files, and so on. And we have provided, let's say, at the output, formats like uh, XML, serif, RDF. We have um, done some work to expose uh, sources through OAI PMH <coughs> so, uh, so that, that we can make this, uh, let's say, uh, harvesting procedure repeatable, uh, even if the sources, uh, just the sources are plain files. So if we have a look at the processing workflow, it's more or less I have uh, already presented that, we load data, we uh, examine the, whether the processing conditions hold. If they are okay, we proceed. If not, we return to data loading. Uh, we apply the transformation workflow, uh, which looks like a little box in the, on the slide, but actually contains the most logic usually. Uh, and we uh, proceed to uh, the generation of output if the output conditions hold. We have a data model here for reference, but I won't go uh, into that. Now, uh, let's see uh, a little bit the implementation. Uh, it's a free, libre, open source library developed in uh, Java. Uh, it's very easy to, uh, to compile it, test it, and integrate in other systems. It's a Maven-based uh, application, so it's, it's very easy to incorporate it uh, also in, uh, in other applications uh, without too much pain. Uh, it's available at uh, Google Code. It's uh, released under a European Union public license, which is a 
a very common license enabling, um, let's say, uh, third parties to do uh, many things uh, with the, uh, the code. It's quite uh, non-restricted, let's say. Um, an important part is that there is configuration outside the code using the uh, common dependency injection mechanisms of the Spring framework. Um, so before running, let's say, the, the transformation, one outside the, the user, let's say, outside the code is able to specify which data loaders will be used, which processing steps will be used, which conditions, which output generator. And also, uh, we have facilities to enable the configuration of the mapping between the um, source and the output format. So all that is done uh, outside the code. For example, we uh, see a little fragment of a mapping specification. This is, I think, from uh, EndNode to Dublin Core, to the um, uh, default DSpace uh, schema. And you see, for example, that uh, TI goes to DC title, uh, AU goes to contributor, creator, and so on. So it's uh, easy to uh, to configure that. And uh, let's uh, have a look at uh, specific use cases. One of the uh, most common uh, most common ones uh, has been for us to generate linked open data out of data in repositories or. Uh, even in uh, in legacy systems, so uh, we have uh, used repository records, cultural heritage systems records, or research information in the serif format uh, to generate linked open data out of all this uh, all this material. Uh, to to do that with our library, we needed to develop the corresponding <coughs> data loaders uh, that we already had from other transformations, actually. Um, we had to apply some filters modifiers, which to a large extent were totally agnostic of uh, RDF, for example, harmonizing dates, harmonizing, let's say, uh, geographic names according to uh, external uh, lists like uh, geo names or uh, uh, Pleiades, uh, which are common in the cultural heritage domain. Um, we use the GINA uh, RDF library to generate RDF triples. Uh, one interesting part there was the generation of specific, let's say, URIs for each entity appearing in in, uh, in the records. They, there have been there well-known, let's say, entities, for example, geographic locations or uh, publications that had uh, already an identifier. But uh, one uh, should also, uh, when providing link open data, uh, provide assign let's say identifiers to um, let's say entities that are uh, provided by the uh, by the same system. So we have uh, incorporated in the system various let's say ways to generate uh, patterns of uh, URIs. Then we have very commonly uh, used uh, this library to populate repositories from sources like uh, Unimark, for example, getting data from bibliographic catalogs and feeding that into repositories, from EndNote, RIS, BibTeX, uh, and so on. We had, of course, to develop data loaders for each format. We reused output generators for repositories. Uh, actually, we have heavily used that with this space. So we use different data loaders, and we um, reuse the same output generator. And we do the opposite also. So from repositories, we export formats like EndNote, RIS, BibTeX, and also we export records in different reference uh, style, styles like Harvard, APA, and so on. Uh, for this, we, we use as a backend the uh, Sitebrook.js library and the citation style language to uh, represent, let's say, the different styles. Another use case was uh, providing input to aggregators. For example, we had to uh, feed data into the VOAR aggregator, which is uh, presented in, um, in this conference uh, also. And uh, there we had to, to get records from the Greek National Arch Archive of Doctoral Dissertations, which we maintained. 
to the VOR aggregator. And there you had, let's say, the relatively simple task to provide to VOR only the uh, records of the thesis that uh, uh, were about uh, agriculture. So uh, were of the uh, thematic area agriculture. So we had to filter out all other records uh, of the repository. Uh, this is a simple, relatively simple task. The interesting part is that we do that behind an OIPMH server, uh, and we needed to uh, provide to, let's say, compile a set to provide to VOR uh, from a pool, let's say, of uh, uh, records that was uh, massive, let's say, compared to the, um, to the relatively small set of records that we wanted to provide. So there we used all these condition mechanisms that we uh, described earlier. And we use the same, uh, let's say, mechanisms to provide the uh, doctoral dissertation archive data to uh, other aggregators like DART, the European portal for uh, doctoral dissertations, and openarchive.gr, which is a Greek aggregator. The same, let's say, architecture has been, to f has been used to feed Europeana with records from a uh, library catalog system that provided uh, its data through a Z39.50 mm -hmm. interface. Then we had to, to retrieve Unimark data and expose it through uh, the uh, OAI PMH interface after mapping it to the European Semantic Elements Schema. Uh, there we managed to do this procedure repeatable and uh, automated. And uh, of course, uh, there we had to, uh, let's say, face many uh, tricky problems relating to uh, harvesting, let's say, uh, Z39.50 sources. But this is totally uh, outside the scope of this uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. So um, regarding future work, uh, obviously this is a constantly evolving tool, so we need to support more and more types of data transformations. And of course, contributions are very much <coughs> welcome uh, for that. Um, we would like to extend the declarative specification of mappings to cover, let's say, more sophisticated cases of mapping. So uh, at the moment, we practically support only one-to-one -one mapping between fields. So it's easy to specify that, but there are cases where you need, of course, uh, more sophisticated mappings like the merging of fields, the splitting of fields, and so on. Uh, we would like to have configurable support for common data models to facilitate, let's say, the reuse or filter and modifier implementations. So say, uh, if we have, uh, let's say, records about publications or research information, we could transform them to serif and build uh, filters and modifiers that uh, read, let's say, uh, serif records so that anything else can be mapped, uh, can be mapped uh, to that. Or let's say the EDM, the European Data Model for, the Euro Europeana uh, Data Model for Cultural Heritage uh, Material. And last but, but certainly not least, uh, we would like to systematically study, let's say, the user experience, the experience of the uh, people that uh, use the tool and, let's say, uh, sort out all the little details in the uh, in this procedure that would uh, make uh, lives uh, easier, th their lives uh, easier. So that's about it. You can uh, uh, go to the online, online code repository and uh, download the code, play with it, uh, see the comprehensive examples with detailed documentation that we have uploaded there, and we're uh, gladly available to uh, discuss with you on this tool to, to clarify any issues, to help uh, if you are using that and uh, uh, you are encountering problems. And of course, uh, we uh, very much welcome any contribution. Thanks very much. You mentioned that you're using uh, CSL and Sidebook.js to process it. Uh, I was wondering, are you using the 
Are you running JavaScript on the client side or on the server side? Uh, we, we're using Node.js on the server side to, to do this processing. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, we have, let's say, uh, a modifier that calls a Node.js server, so to say, that just to, in simplistic, let's say, terms. And this is the uh, end of this, um, of this session. We don't have any other speakers, so we're ending a little early. Um, just as a reminder, um, next up is a, is a break and the next session. And at, again, at five is the developers um, challenge, um, which will be in this space. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>